I'm going to speak in my uh, capacity as a journalist, my experience uh, in the media and, the, and what we've seen social media uh, and the internet generally do. Uh, traditional media, you know, is something we've become used to for almost a century in the sense that uh, we cr if you break it down, you have the output of many journalists uh, who congregate in one place to consume, uh, congregate in one place where the public, the audiences, uh, consume that output. Uh, and that's disseminated, whether it's a newspaper or a, channel, a TV channel or a particular point on a radio dial. Science journalism has mimicked this. Um, science is news, but it's also complex and has a specialised vocabulary. Uh, it needs to be, you need specialised reporters who understand it, speak to the experts, extract the meaning, uh, and then translate it to a common vocabulary, and then disseminated, the, disseminated, sorry. Um, this cosy, this <laughs> <laughs> you would probably think it's a Freudian slip. Uh, it's a cosy state of affairs, isn't it? and it has been um, uh, for some time. It's served journalists, scientists, and I would argue the public relatively well for almost a century. Social media is disrupting this, this flow. Um, it is connecting audiences directly with scientists. Um, Archivex, uh, archives.org is a wonderful example where you can actually see pre-published papers by scientists before, there's no embargo, and anyone can go there and see the papers uh, come out. It's an extraordinary uh, and wonderfully successful experiment. Um, so, but social media is only one of the disruptive technologies that are having an impact on traditional media of TV, radio, and print. Uh, some are enhancing it. Uh, others are tearing the media model apart. It kind of depends on how you look at it. I'll give an example. Um, people have been calling for the that the death of newspapers uh, is coming, and they've been doing it for more than a decade. Um, the truth is actually the exact opposite. Um, newspapers are not dying, they've actually never had so many readers as they have now. Uh, if you count the number of readers in print, online, iPad and mobile editions, um, as well as all the people who view videos in multimedia galleries, newspapers are delivering mass audiences like never before. Um, Add in the newspaper reporters who are tweeting, and there's actually probably a staggering renaissance in newspaper reporting. What is dying is the vast rivers of gold um, that used to fund those newspapers. Um, they used to make their dosh in three different ways. Um, subscriptions and retail sales, which are always marginal. Um, display advertising, which is always nice cream. Um, but the majority, the absolute... Um, uh, the real engines of vast fat profits were classifieds advertising. And classifieds, um, just to give you an example, I mean, it's hard to believe that this is how the world was just 10 years ago. Mm. You'd, have, you'd pay something like $8 a line on a classified, and you know, a big broadsheet newspaper would probably fit about 2,800 lines a page. So they could make $22,000 a page. Um, and newspapers, if you remember 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they had very large classified sections. So when I say rivers of gold, I'm not kidding. Um, then internet classifieds came along in the late 90s and uh, they were way, way cheaper. In fact, they were way, way better. You could find stuff faster uh, through you know, searching for stuff and you could uh, see pictures of what you're interested in. And what began as a trickle quickly became a tsunami. Um, the global market for classifieds in 2003 was 100 billion US dollars, which actually were worth a lot more then than they are now. <laughs> Uh, that market has largely evaporated. Uh, classifieds today are free or they're very cheap. Display ads have got been hemorrhaging to the millions of sites on the net. Today, if newspaper runs an ad, it's, they make one hundredth of what they used to from a display ad. Um, so if you like, the newspaper pages have shrunk and we've seen newsrooms shrink too. Uh, I mention newspapers only because of the most dramatic example of this disruptive power of the internet on journalism. It's created audiences more massive than we've ever had, but it's also stripped away at the foundations um, that, for, that allowed them to function and actually le led to the mass sacking of many reporters. Now anyone, as Natasha referred to, can become a Rupert Murdoch, if you like. Uh, anyone can launch a blog or a news website, and it can look schmick, um, even if it's a load of tripe. Now that's actually a good thing. You might think that I'm arguing against it, but it's actually a good thing. Uh, where journalists and science communicators once acted as gatekeepers for audiences, they can now facilitate engagement. Um, but it does mean that audiences don't necessarily come to us, we have to go after them. We have to do our story, now here's an example of the average day of the journalist today. We have to do our, our story in print, radio or TV. 
then we write the online version with extra links and background. Uh, then we blog about those stories we've done and reflect on them uh, with more links. And then we tweet that to a group of followers, uh, linking back to our stories. We might even create a podcast or a vodcast version and maybe even send out a summary of the stories at the end of the week in an e-newsletter or a YouTube update. So, you know, there's a lot of extra work for journalists, but there's no extra bodies to do that work. And throughout newsrooms across the world, the number of journalists have shrunk while the uh, workload has increased. Um, has this affected the quality of reporting? Well, I think it has. Can citizen journalism fill the gap? Um, well, I would argue yes and no. Some independent bloggers, podcasters and vodcasters have become authorities on specialised topics. What they produce is respected and ardently followed. But technology is a double-edged sword. The same forces that liberated these voices and brought them to us, unfettered by the filters of traditional media, have also allowed spin meisters and the unscrupulous to manipulate the public sphere. When I was news editor of ABC Online, ABC Science Online, I had uh, spent something like 5% of my time answering official complaints uh, of our coverage of climate change alone. Um, they would often be the usual suspects or different people, people arguing the same hoary old lines. Because the ABC has a very strict policy regarding official complaints, uh, and the climate change deniers knew this, they would clog the email boxes with complaints we had to answer. Um, I don't think they ever really expected us to correct or retract a story. Uh, we could justify each story and point to evidence whilst doing so, and I don't recall ever correcting a story um, while I was there. But I think that uh, what they hope to do is make us less likely to do climate change stories uh, and be more hesitant about the evidence, uh, publishing the evidence when we did. Um, they wanted to make it hard, annoying and a hassle, so that maybe we wouldn't. For the record, we kept doing it. In fact, if you know anything about how I operate, it actually encourages me to do more. <laughs> Uh, it also means that the climate change deniers the, or anti-vaccination campaigners or conspiracy theorists like Berthers who say that um, you know, Barack Obama wasn't born in the US um, and other undesirables can create swish looking websites that are beautifully designed, full of tables and facts and look really convincing but are actually a load of hogwash. Um, it also means that these undesirables can coordinate assaults and comment sections of media sites whenever stories they don't like are published and write post after post attacking the story. Climate change critics are particularly adept at this. I suspect they're actually funded from outside. Um, it's just too orchestrated. Uh, they strike within hours of a story going up and can overwhelm comment sections sometimes with quite nasty attacks. Not just the journalist who wrote it or the scientist quoted, but uh, you know, comment contributors on the site attacking each other. Um, they often quote spurious evidence that is shallow, immaterial, widely inaccurate, but can sound convincing at first. This gives readers the impression there is a fierce debate or a divided opinion on the topic, where in fact that may not be the case. How do you deal with them? Well, at Cosmos, um, if the comments are repetitive cookie-cutter objections by the same old characters or do not speak directly to the article or attack scientists, journalists and others, Al Gore is a favourite, um, in a vitriolic or personal fashion, we delete them. Uh, we also delete links to the nefarious sites which can often accompany these comments and the sites seriously are nefarious if you check some of them. So why do we do this? Because we're journalists and we're trained to make these sorts of judgments, are we not? We're mediators now. Uh, whereas before we were gatekeepers, we could become gatekeepers perhaps in a different way I would argue. Uh, we're trained to try and sort facts from fiction, sidestep the bullshit, um, sniff out conflicts of interest and avoid getting the wool pulled over our eyes. So I think that journalists can bring real value to the world of Web 2.0 and can continue to do their sacred duty of reporting in a fair and balanced manner. Thank you.